Good morning. I'm honored and delighted to be here to share with you a few uh, conclusions from the study that we have done on freight transport in France. My name is Ruben Fisher, and I've worked on this subject for the Shift Project since 2020. Harold gave me a promotion. I am definitely not the head of the Shift Project. I'm in charge of freight project management, but the head of the Shift Project um, is Mathieu Ozano, who is here in the crowd, and also Jean-Marc Jancovici. I did this on a pro bono basis, as I have a daytime job as a sustainability manager uh, within a French company that works in the transport and logistics uh, sector. And I'm now co-founder and manager of a sustainability cooperative uh, consulting firm called Novalera. Despite the English name, the Shift Project is actually a French entity. It's a non-profit, it's a not-for-profit association guided by scientific rigor. So basically, when we aim to discuss subjects, we talk about facts and figures, and we don't base our arguments on ideologies. We aim to contribute and to aim to uh, influence decisions on subjects pertaining to two things, energy on one hand and carbon emissions or greenhouse gas emissions on the other hand. We've coined a term uh, which we use very frequently, which is the double carbon constraint. Constraint number one, we feel, is that we have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But as if that wasn't enough, constraint number two is that we feel that we need to prepare for scarcer fossil fuels in the future. With this double carbon constraint in mind, in March 2020, during lockdown, we kicked off a project called the Transformation Plan of the French Economy. So the acronym is in French, PTEF. And the aim is to, field by field, work out how we can do three things. Aim for a low carbon functioning, uh, a, a less carbon intensive freight, for example, in my case. Number two, make the sector more resilient, all the while while preserving employment and making sure that um, in our systemic approach, we focused on the amount of energy that we needed in total for all of the fields, and we were careful to check that it didn't exceed total energy production capacity. This led us to certain conclusions about frugality, more of which a little bit later. A summary of the different findings of the sectors on which we worked on are compiled in a book, which, much to our surprise, has sold over 100,000 copies in France. So the report on the freight sector was published in March 2022, and in the work leading up to then, when we interviewed company representatives and we asked questions about energy consumption and frugality, quite often the action was, meh, it wasn't really a subject. So this isn't to say that we told you so, but it is a gentle reminder um, that the subject of energy, both in terms of costs and in terms of supply, has become much more visible and acute as those examples from here and in England should go to show. Last year in the UK, the cost of energy rose so much that we needed to implement what we call warm shelters. Basically, for families who couldn't afford to heat their homes, they went to safe spaces to get relief from the cold. And without saying that it's going to be in the same thing in France, I'd just like to point out that there's been a 10% increase in the cost of electri electricity sorry, for households. So that's the energy part uh, in terms of climate change. But linking back to green gas, greenhouse gas emissions, this is an example of what can happen uh, to railway tracks in what we used to call extreme heat. Roads don't fare that much better in what are going to be, unfortunately, future normal temperatures. This leads me to, say, to think about a quote um, from a science fiction author called William Gibson, who wrote a novel called Neuromancer and who coined the term cyberspace. And his point of view is to say that the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. But then again, when we do talk about the future, the reaction is, well, what's the rush? It's the future that we're talking about. Well, actually, to fundamentally change things, to fundamentally transform our society, these are the various time frames that we're looking at. So it takes more or less 15 years to completely renew a, a fleet of vehicles on the road, so moving, for example, from fossil fuels to electric. We're talking about 20 years to completely modify our energy mix, so moving from natural gas and coal to renewables, for example. 
30 years to redesign the whole industrial landscape, so bringing back uh, into our respective countries some of the things that we exported to other countries in terms of infrastructure and production capacity. And more or less 50 years to design future-proof towns. So when you look at it like that, we are already late for the future. But let's drill down to freight. Because in this period of virtual reality, cloud storage, metaverse, and digitalization, we are still in the same place. We need to move stuff from one site to another, to process it, to refine it, then move it somewhere else, by boat or bike, by truck or by train, to assemble or transform, then move the stuff again to another site, to stock, to set up, or to sell. It's the way our physical economy works. It applies to agriculture, commerce, the health industry. It's been that way for ages. And that's why we refer to freight as the keystone or the cornerstone of the economy. For all this to happen, we need energy to fuel the transportation. The vehicles need infrastructure to move along, rail, road, or inland waterway, and labor, because all of this is dependent upon labor, packing, unloading, shipping, etc. As an illustration, we say that Paris and other major cities only have three days of stock of food ahead of them. So in a way, no freight, no French cuisine. So if we can't do without freight, it looks like we're going to have to decarbonize it. The data I'm displaying is for mainland France, and on the graph on the left, basically what we see is that at best emissions have flatlined. And actually, even though emissions for transport sector went down last year in 2023, they are still higher than they were in the reference year 1990. Moreover, in terms of energy um, that's used to transport stuff, 90% of what's transported in France is still dependent and still uses liquid fossil fuels. So how come? Like people who work in the transport sector, we're all climate baddies. I think, of course not. We've made fabulous technological improvements in terms of energy efficiency, in terms of uh, intensity of uh, carbon, uh, carbon intensity, sorry, in terms of energy. We've improved our operational processes to increase vehicle fill rate, but unfortunately, none of that is enough, and emissions have not gone down. The graph shows that different factors in what we call the Kaya identity, which contribute to overall uh, greenhouse emissions. And the ones that you see outlined within the red box are above one, and these are the factors which have increased emissions, and the ones which are uh, in the green circle are the ones that have brought emissions down. So we can see that we have some factors that have brought down emissions by 10%, such as energy efficiency, but when we compare this to the factors that have increased emissions, which are two, basically increased transport and the move to road transport, we see that the scale is completely different. We've got 10% on one hand, and 200% or 340% on the other hand. So in a nutshell, when we say that we're multiplying by three the amount of things we transport and multiplying by two the share of road transportation, we can continue to make as many technical or technological improvements or innovations, but the differences in scale between marginal gains on one hand and the fabulous increase in emissions on the other hand is not just um, it means that we just can't rely on innovation or technology to help solve the problem. So maybe we need a helping hand. And when I'm talking about a helping hand, I'm going to talk about law. Uh, so bear with me for a moment. Our report contains 55 measures, so obviously I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm going to try to highlight three quite quickly. The first one is that in France, freight depends on two sets of law. Uh, one of them is town planning, and the other one is transport. But at the national level, there's no consolidation. So we feel that we, there should be a form of ministry, or another such entity, which should be in charge of governing both the sector and implementing uh, a pathway and making sure that entities respect that pathway of reductions. At a second level, at a regional level, we suggest that in terms of administrative uh, management, any given region uh, has the capacity to organize the physical aspects of freight, making sure that it's pulling the actors together of the ecosystem to ensure opportunities for pooling, for example. We need to reinforce uh, the framework for towns to actually organize, regulate, and subcontract, for example, urban logistics, enabling them to deploy cycle logistics and pooling of goods. And actually, the existing legal framework between what transport authorities can actually do now and the, uh, what we suggest they should do in the future, the current remit isn't that far off. 
And when we asked private companies what they felt about this, surprisingly enough, the answer was overall quite positive. Basically, they said that as long as the rules are the same for all, so a level playing field, with a mid to long plan, plan to give companies sufficient uh, view of what's coming up on the horizon, then it was actually fine for everybody. A second suggestion which we think would be useful to see on the horizon is a specific framework for business creation and running based on the solid foundation of knowledge of energy and climate issues linked to the freight sector. This means that, for example, for existing examinations and capacities, they need to be amended and updated, so both for drivers and transport license holders. But also for company owners, we recommend a kind of climate capacity without which the company owner cannot open or run a business in the transport sector, or the freight sector, sorry. More generally, we believe that the substantial training program on the subject of climate and energy issues should be implemented for all players in the sector to bolster general knowledge, but also to make sure that we increase understanding of both the subject in general and the answers uh, to the crisis in question. The second point in this is what we call a decarbonization effort certificate. Basically, this effort would reward both shippers, freight forwarders, and transporters on the basis of, for example, average emissions per ton kilometer with an enforced reduction pathway. So this year, these are your emissions. Next year, you're allowed to limit a little bit less. The second thing would be based on average energy consumption per ton kilometer, also with a reduction pathway. This, we feel, would obviously help to encourage shippers, freight forwarders, as well as the whole sector to implement the various changes which enable a less carbon-intensive transportation. I've shown, the, I've shown the spotlight on a couple of measures, um, but I have to stress that taken in isolation, maybe they don't seem as logical as they should be because the 55 measures are all part of one bundle. I'd like us to just have a quick look at the results that we get in our projection of freight in France in 2050. If we do implement all of the measures and the proposals that we put forward in our report, in 2050, freight emissions are 97% lower than the business as usual scenario, which takes, to account, which takes into account sorry, population growth. The main levers of the decrease in emissions in order of importance are electrification, which makes up for almost 50% of the reductions, but only when we have reduced demand. So only when we transport less, and this reduction is something around 30%. Then we have what I may say the more usual factors, such as the modal shift to rail and waterway transport, making up for about 10%. And then four levers with a similar level of impact, which are eco-driving, massification, pooling, and cycle logistics. Sometimes we get the question, why bother doing all that anyway? Can't we just like implement technology and can't we get the same results doing it that way? So if we go back to the energy constraints which I mentioned at the beginning of these slides, um, if we do bet on unlimited supply of cheap and uh, car less carbon intensive energy, we don't think it's a good idea, but we did the calculations anyway. So what the graph shows is that basically four different options. The first three are we change as little as possible in terms of operational process. There's no work done on any frugality, and we just change the energy vector. First graph is biofuels, biodiesel. Second graph is hydrogen. The third bar um, is all electrification. And the fourth, which is the option that we promote, is a mix of all of that, but having first implemented all of the necessary frugality. So as you can see, basically, there's a scale of one to three between the amount of energy that's needed if we do implement frugality and different changes to reduce the amount of transport that we do. And if we just um, bear with technology in the business as usual scenario, just changing the vector that we use. To summarize what I'd love you to remember after this talk, first and foremost, that it can be done. We can reduce emissions. We can do this um, whilst improving resilience and creating jobs within the sector. This, I feel, is excellent news, news which I would like to highlight. And the six main levers to make this happen are, number one, I think I've said it a couple of times, reduce demand. Number two, plan and govern the sector. Number three, electrify everything we can. Number four, move to alternative modes of transport, so rail and inland waterway. Number five, redesign urban, area, urban areas in general, but also to include cycle logistics. And number six, 
train, teach, certify and qualify to make sure that all of the actors in the sector understand what is being done, what the risks are, what's at stake and why we are proposing a certain amount of uh, answers and solutions. I'm going to add a postscriptum. Um, the event that we are attending is called Change Now and it's not called Change Later. So I was thinking about this and well, what can we do at a very short term basis? We've seen the actions that we need to get results in the next 20 years, um, and I think many companies and many organizations have plans for 2030, 2040, 2050. There's one simple and immediate action which I feel that we all can do, and that's to slow down. When I say this, I mean, for example, slow down the trucks that are on the motorways that currently drive at 90 kilometers per hour in France, Italy, and Spain, and bring them down to 80 kilometers per hour, like it is the case in Germany. According to our calculations, this would enable us to reduce emissions in France by 2 to 3% of the transport sector, therefore just one measure which would enable us to hit our yearly target. In terms of cost efficiency, we also think that this is one of the cheapest ways, if not a also a way of saving money, when you bring that to what does it cost on one side and how much carbon am I economizing on the other side. So in a nutshell, let's slow down, let's be frugal, let's implement the various operational improvements which will be discussed in the following sessions and electrify all the remaining road transportation. <laughs>